Welcome to the HR7 Super Integration Host Workflow Designer. With it, you can transform HR7 messages to and from different formats, such as JSON, CSV, or XML. You can also send and receive messages via TCP, HTTPS, databases, web services, and more, or even enable HR7 in your products. This video delves into many places that none of our other videos do, and it's essential viewing for mastery of HR7 interfaces. But once you've reached the end, be sure to check out our many great tutorials that give you step-by-step -step instructions on how to perform various tasks. The workflow designer is divided into three. On the very left is the list of steps that will be performed. We call the individual steps activities, and the list we call a workflow. Activities can be added by clicking the Add New button. You can insert activities between others, reorder them by dragging and dropping, delete them, Disable them so they aren't validated or executed, and enable them again. The first activity is a special one. It can't be moved or deleted because it defines the action that starts off the execution of the workflow. We call this first activity the receiver activity. The center section shows the details of the activity that's currently selected. The action that will be performed by each activity is selectable at the top of the details panel. Common use cases such as TCP, HTTPS, web services, and databases are all supported, and there's even a code activity if you think some C sharp would help. The list of activities is also extensible and can be expanded by the team at HR7Soup, or you can even create your own in .NET. It's worth noting that the available list of activity types differs from the receiver activity, as these are all trigger actions that will start an instance of a workflow running and acquires the inbound message. Activities after the first often focus on sending the message to other systems, but some can obtain additional data too. Nothing at this level represents how we will be altering or converting the data. We'll get to that shortly. As we switch between activity types, we get a set of options relevant to performing the action. Other tutorials go into the configuration of these activities in detail, so I'll skip most of these settings, but jump down to the message template a key field which is in almost every activity type. For the receiving activities, it represents an example of the inbound message. So if you have one, paste it in. It's not required to proceed, but the ease of mapping your messages will be significantly improved. Some samples are available on the right-click menu if you don't have a message handy. Notice as I add in the message template, the bindings panel on the right is populated with a tree structure representing this message. We'll see what can be done with the bindings panel shortly, but for now, notice how clicking on a field in the message template selects the corresponding item in the bindings panel and vice versa. Also, if we edit the message and add or delete a field, it will be reflected almost immediately in the binding panel. So if a field you need is missing from the binding panel, just add it into the message template. For any activity after the receiver, the message template represents the outbound message. For instance, it's the message being sent in a TCP sender, or the file being written in a file writer. When the activity was created, it automatically had its message template populated with a binding to the receiver's inbound message. That's what this blue highlighted text represents. This activity will send on the same message that the workflow initially received. I can, however, delete this binding, just like any other piece of text, or add it back in again by right-clicking, inserting activity message, and then selecting which activity. It needn't be the receiver activity either. It could just as easily utilize the message sent or returned by any preceding activity. Using message templates with bindings is a great way to relay a message between systems with minor alterations. If you're converting between message types or making substantial changes within the same message type, you should start by deleting the binding, inserting an example of the message that you'll be converting to, and selecting the message type. If we run this workflow now, it would wait for an inbound message, then send off this message exactly as it was written here. That's great, that's our general plan. And along with relays, it's a very common workflow scenario. But what's missing is how we alter or map the incoming values into this outbound message. There are several ways to map values from one message to another. One of the simplest 
is to use the binding tree that it populated earlier. See how I can drag fields from the binding tree directly into the message template. At runtime, these purple placeholders will be replaced with the source value. Notice this drop down on the top of the bindings tree. This enables you to select which activity you want to get your data from. It defaults to the receiver's inbound message, but you can mix and match from any previous activity or even from values stored in memory called variables. More on these shortly. But first, let's click on the Transformers tab of the Activity Details and take a look at other ways of mapping values. Each activity has its own list of transformers that are executed just before the message is sent out. Transformers are a list of steps that define how values are to be mapped between messages. The Center Transformers panel will list all the steps and mappings that will be performed, while the trees on either side represent where you can acquire data from, as well as where in your outbound message it can go. Note that the source tree is functionally just like the binding tree, and you can use them interchangeably. If you don't have a source tree available in your version of the designer, just use the binding tree instead. By dragging a field from the source tree to a field in the destination tree, we've created a transformer that maps values across. You could potentially map all of your fields this way, mapping from one field to another until you've mapped them all. Notice how clicking a field in the tree will highlight all the transformers that use it. Alternatively, selecting a mapping transformer will highlight the corresponding field in the trees. Details of the current transformer is shown down here in the details panel. See that the to and source path are populated with a syntax representing where in the message to get and set the values. You can change the paths by dragging in different paths from the relevant tree, or by manually typing too. The path needn't be in your message template either. The source path might represent a value that may not always exist. If the to path doesn't exist in your message template, it will be automatically appended with the appropriate message structure that's required. Just quickly, the path syntax are common to other systems and based on common standards. HL7 is the segment name dash field dot component dot subcomponent. Each of these can include an index too for repeated segments or fields. If indexes are omitted, then the first instance will be assumed. Fire, XML, and JSON use a simplified XPath syntax, separating the hierarchy of nodes with a forward slash, and with attributes signified by their name starting with an at. If you require strict.NET XPath, then preface this path with XPath colon, but it's generally not required. A CSV path is just the index of the fields in square brackets. If you take a look at the end of the source path, you can see an anchor button. Clicking it allows you to select which activity your path is acquiring the data from. Of note is the text and variables at the top. Selecting text and variables mean that this text now represents a literal value rather than that of a path. Also notice how the text color changed to blue. A standard throughout the workflow designer is that any text that supports binding is colored. Green if it's a path bound to an activity, red if it's bound to an activity but the path is invalid, and blue if it's text and variables with the variable shown in purple. So now I've selected text and variables, whatever I type here will be literally put into this message. If you start finding paths in your outbound message, it's because you need to set the source activity via the anchor button to an activity rather than text and variables. However, text and variables does allow you to insert variables into the text. If I right click, I can select a variable to insert. Some default variables are always available to me, such as the date of the message, but any variable you create will also be listed here. What's more, I can add multiple variables along with literal text to build up a complex string of text. I'll add another variable, for example. Then is the allow message structure to change checkbox. By default, it's not selected, and that means any characters reserved for that message type, such as an ampersand for XML or HL7, will be automatically encoded or escaped so that it doesn't corrupt the message. If you instead check this box, you can include message structure altering characters and build up the message on the fly. There are many transformer types available to you. 
set variable value either creates a variable or alters the value of an existing one. See now that I've created a variable, it becomes available to be used in the mappings or other transformers. A shortcut to create a variable populated from the message field is to drop a source value directly into the transformers list, and the variable will be generated and already bound to that source. You may want to edit the name, though it's not essential. Also remember earlier when we dragged from the binding tree directly into the message template? Well, that was behind the scenes creating a set variable transformer, populated by its source, and then putting a variable placeholder into the message. The same thing could have been done manually too. You set the values of variables using much the same technique we did with the mapping, though it's worth noting that this additional text box called sample value. This is a design time helper that allows the binding trees to include fields that are created by the variables, which is convenient if you're altering the message structure with a variable but still want easy mapping with drag and drop. The begin and end conditional transformers add as a pair, and transformers placed between only execute if the condition is met. Notice how you can add in multiple criteria arguments, or adjust if they're and or all comparisons. Complex criteria can be created by adding groups, which act like brackets in your criteria logic. The for each and next transformers allow looping over repeated values. For any transformer executed between the for next pair, any binding or mapping that refers to something in that loop will take the value of the iterated item instead. There is an example of this in our JSON to HL7 and XML to HL7 tutorials if you want to see this in action. The comments transformer allows you to add comments to your transformers tree, which is helpful when things get complicated. Adding a code transformer lets you write c -sharp code and that performs just about anything you want. If you're a c -sharp developer, you may wish to do all or some of the transformations in code. There is a fantastic API for HL7 included too with IntelliSense and more. It's beyond this video, but check out the coding cheat sheet in our tutorials if you'd like to know more. You can even create your own transformers with Visual Studio that are easily distributable. See our custom transformers tutorial for details. At times, you'll need to format your data. Dates are almost always formatted with HL7 integrations. Fortunately, everywhere that accepts a mapping or is bindable supports easy formatting, as does every variable. I can right click and select the format of my choice, and there's even the ability to create my own format. Dates are not the only thing either. You can make sure your IDs are padded with zeros or your names are capitalized correctly. Using McName casing even formats surnames and addresses with complex capitalization correctly. That will keep Mr. McDonald happy. You saw earlier that mapping transformers were encoded or escaped correctly by default. Well, you can also escape variables too with a simple right click option. Filters are another tab available to the activity details. Filters can be used to control which activities execute based on the data. Providing that the criteria evaluates to true, then the activity will be executed. An activity that's filtered won't execute and the workflow will continue to the next activity. However, if a receiver activity is filtered, then no further activities will be executed. Filters have the same logical creation abilities as conditional transformers. Ands, ors, and groups are available. Using the binding tree is a great way to simplify which fields are going to be examined. Dragging in creates criteria already mapped to the path, while dragging and holding shift will map that path to a variable and base its criteria on that. Also, don't forget the auto-generated variables. The workflow error is always available. It's false when everything is fine and true if something's failed. The filters happen before the main function of the activity executes. So they've got their own transformers list in case you need to create a variable or some other task. You probably won't need to touch these transformers, but it's worth knowing they're there if you need them. Now is probably the perfect time to show you the execution order. As you can see, the message comes in, any filter transformers are executed, then the receiving activity filters. Providing that the message wasn't filtered and there are no other activities, we proceed to the first activity. Its filter transformers are processed ready for the filters to follow. Providing the activity isn't filtered, the main transformers execute, which maps your messages together, and the activity is processed or sent depending on its function. If it's configured to get back a response, then it will wait for that to be returned. There can of course be many activities, so the green section will repeat for each of them until all the activities have been processed or filtered. 
Finally, we return control back to the receiving activity, execute the response transformers, preparing the message to return, and finally send it back. Not all receiver activities respond back, and some others that can respond default to an automatically generated response. These will not have response transformers and won't have the transformers tab shown on the details panel. Remember that transformers in a receiver activity execute after all the activities, so don't accidentally try transforming data for other activities here. A navigation tip. When navigating activities, you may also click these icons to go directly to the transformers or filters of an activity. Two message types are perhaps less obvious than the others, text and binary. You can't use these in message mappings because they don't have any message structure to be parsed into fields. However, they can be populated with variables or direct activity binding. They may actually be very helpful to you. Text is just a simple blob of text which can be built up by appending variables to it. Because it has no structure, it isn't validated for correctness. It allows you to construct other message types with more freedom. For instance, you can create multi-line CSV from OBX values from a single message, or build JSON message structure with variables. Binary message types are used to preserve binary files like PDFs or images that would be corrupted if converted into text. The file writer will also automatically write Base64 encoded data to a binary file too. Finally, in the right column, we have the message logs. They list the most recent 1000 workflows executed since the app was loaded in HL7 Soup, or if integration host, the logs are persisted and it can be a much more extensive history. Message logs record the messages your workflow and activities send and receive. Variable values as activities execute, error messages, and the duration and time of the execution. They're critical for debugging your workflows, so it's helpful to keep them handy while editing and designing. If an HL7 message is clicked in the logs, the current path is highlighted in the message templates and the binding tree and the transforms. For instance, clicking on a faulty binding value in the logs will automatically highlight any transformer that refers to that field. If this video has helped you, why not consider subscribing or return the favor and give us a like. Don't forget to check out our tutorial library where we have step-by-step -step instructions for many workflow scenarios.